Hello and welcome to episode 42 of the Aquarius Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Reed. To open up this episode, I would like to give a huge thank you to you, the listener. Whether you've been enjoying the podcast since the beginning with episode one, or this is your first time ever tuning in, I want to express my gratitude and hope you continue to listen and share the podcast. The positive comments I get from you, the listeners, are quite frankly awesome and continue to fuel the enjoyment I have in publishing this podcast. In a huge bit of news, I'm thrilled to say that the Aquarius Podcast has been picked up by a new sponsor. As of this episode, the Aquarius Podcast is being brought to you by Owaza. Wait, Owaza who? You might be asking that right about now, and that's okay. Because in the coming weeks, I'm going to use this intro section of the podcast to bring you more about Awaza, their products that I'm using in my own fish room, which, for the record, I've been running for several months now, and even have an Awaza representative on this show to talk more in depth about the organization and their product offerings. One thing to know is that Awaza has been around for a long time and has a strong presence in the outdoor water garden market. So, if you're a pond person, you know exactly who I'm talking about. Awaza is introducing a full line of indoor aquarium products to the U.S. market, and they want to get the word out. So be thankful that the podcast didn't end up getting sponsored by Bob's Used Mattress Outlet and instead is being brought to you by a world-class manufacturer in the outdoor pond and indoor aquatics market. Now, on to the interview. Today's date is Thursday, December 7th, 2018. My guest today is Preston John. Preston is a home hobbyist who is successfully breeding the Tetraodon Shodentai Puffer, a.k.a. the Congo Spotted Puffer, at his home in Phoenix, Arizona. Preston is passionate about sharing all he can about breeding this puffer so that other aquarists can be successful breeding them as well. Oddly enough, he doesn't have a home club to join in his city, but he is a member of the Minnesota Aquarium Society because he happens to travel there frequently for work. So Preston, welcome to the Aquarist Podcast. Thank you, Randy. It's good to be here. Yeah, thank you very much for taking time to talk to a complete stranger. And, you know, this is a... You are doing something that is apparently one of the most difficult things to do in our hobby, and that's breeding the the Shodentai puffer, or at least one that um, you know not many people know how to do. So, I mean, congratulations, hats off, and I'm sure that at the Minnesota Aquarium Society, you've probably got like a billion Breeders Award program uh, points built up from uh, from breeding this guy. <laughs> you know, I I need to check into that. Oh yeah, you got to submit the uh, the bad points. <laughs> you, you may be able to pull off a uh, 2018 like grand champion uh, breeder for the club if you uh, if you submit this guy. That's not a bad idea. All right, Preston. So you did not join into this hobby immediately breeding this puffer. So what what's your origin story, man? How'd you get started keeping tropical fish? Well, it's a it's a short one. I about three years ago, I was feeling a little stressed at work, and I read some article that said. Fish will, you know, are as good as antidepressants, which I went, eh, probably not true, but I went and bought a beta and I just had it on my desk here at the office. So as yet, yeah, almost three years ago, uh, that one little beta quickly turned into six betas at my, you know, here in my office, which then turned into, I think all said I had like 42 different things in my office here at work. Oh, that's awesome. And now, do you think, so So three years ago, would that Preston think that multiple tank syndrome would have afflicted him this bad as it is at present? Um, yeah, probably. I've got one of those <laughs> collector-itises. So you kind of knew, um, knew this thing was going to spiral out of control and turn into something crazy. I, I didn't think it was going to turn into what it did, for sure. Um, had I known, I would have planned my fish room at home much better. And uh, not have to redo it. Yeah, the redoing an active fish room is is uh, a thousand times harder than just building one from scratch. Yeah, hindsight is definitely twenty twenty when it comes to uh, building a fish room. And you know, even me having talked to people about laying out a fish room and building a fish room, I mean, there's still things that I did that you know I, I wish I could have gone back and undo. Um, I think some of that though is until you physically get something in place. Um, it, at least for me, like I'm not a CAD trained engineer, so I'm not able to, to completely dial something out. Um, I guess, you know, you have to have something physically up and running and then you realize, oh, I, I shouldn't have done that or I should have done this differently. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's going back to hindsight as well, which I'm, I'm glad this happened, but when I, one of the first fish that I purchased after the betas uh, were celestial pearl danios. I you know, I thought they were like the coolest thing ever. They look like little trouts. 
Uh, but the people at the local fish store where I purchased them said, hey, these they have to eat live food now, which I didn't care. I was like, eh, they're a cool fish. I want it in my tank. So I figured out, okay, what's live food, you know, and came across Daphne. I ordered some online. That, the experience of doing Daphne, you know, even such early you know, early on and keeping them alive, I think that played a, a big role in where I'm at right now as well. Were the, um, I, I guess, what was what was one of the first fish that you were able to successfully breed? Uh, first fish. Or take me down. Now, are we a... talking on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> no, we can do we can do accident as well. Like take me down, kind of your you know a high level view of your journey of at least from the breeding perspective to the point where you where you get to the uh, the show den size. All right, so I think that well, the first thing that I actually got that bred other than Daphnia, uh, I guess they didn't really breed; they cloned. But uh, when I saw my first cherry shrimp, I. Like, those are the coolest things, and I think I bought like twelve of them. And they're like nine ninety nine a piece, and those all of a sudden I started having more and more and more of more of them. Uh, I think that's kind of my live bearer, or my, my that's my uh, live bearer. Yeah, that's your guppy. And a part, yeah, my yeah, guppies. Yeah. It's uh, when they when they started pumping out little little ones, and they were growing up, and it's just like this is the coolest thing ever. Um, so I. I've got cherry shrimp about everywhere. Uh, but from there, I think uh, my first breeding of fish happened with uh, white cloud minnows, the golden ones. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily on purpose, but I, I bought them thinking, hey, I can, I know they're going to breed because everybody says they're going to breed. So I'm sure enough they did to the, you know, they overflowed, overflowed with babies. Couldn't give them to the stores anymore. So, uh, but let's see here. So most, I would say the last, I'm going to start, kind of start over here. The getting to the, to the uh, spotted Congo puffers. Uh, let's see here. Most of my breeding other than the, you know, the non-accidental ones. Uh, well, let's see here. I'm trying to remember my own history. No, no worries. Don't worry. This is a free show. So people don't get to complain. <laughs> uh, I would say my first real attempt at, at breeding was with the peacock gobies or peacock gudgeon. You'd call it. I bought two of them, a male and a female. Uh, put them in a twenty-gallon long. Uh, did everything I I could, you know, as far as reading and watching YouTube videos and stuff, and nothing seemed to work. Uh, so I kind of gave up on it. I just kept feeding them Daphnia. Lots of Daphnia. And then one day I looked in there and there was just hundreds of babies. So, like so many that the parents couldn't eat all of them. <laughs> nice. So, you know, because I was feeding Daphne every day as well. Uh-huh. Uh, just not really paying a whole lot of attention to them. I kind of gave up on them uh, and kind of was moving into trying to, to breed uh, Chinese hill stream lodges and which, which I hadn't, uh, uh, been successful at yet uh but so i with those i i took out all the babies and uh, was kind of frantic about it made you know mistakes moving stuff around too soon and uh, none of the baby or the the fry died but i did lose my female and and just kind of like moving stuff around you know being a, a newbie but from there so that was probably a year and a half ago and now I've got so many peacock gobies that you know, they just show up all of a sudden. Like, there'll be one in a puffer tank. <laughs> Where did you come from? <laughs> you know, that, that kind of a thing. Nice. Um, so, but uh, I, w- I would say, as far as my breeding, on the, the on purposes were the uh, Chinese hill stream loach, which when I was successful at breeding them, I immediately stopped. I, it, it wasn't like a do it again kind of a thing. It was like these things are just taking way too, too long and hard, and I never see them. So, 
So how did you arrive? Yeah. Like, how did you go from the uh, peacock gudgeons to like, I want to do Chinese hill stream loaches? Is it just what catches your <laughs> eye, or like, what's your thought at, process? At that, at that point, it, yeah, it was it was really it was like I really like that fish. I need to buy a whole bunch of those. And after the cherry shrimp, it was like every I need everything to breed. Mm. Why isn't stuff breeding? Gotcha. You now, uh, yeah, made attempts at like breeding. Uh, bamboo shrimp and, you know, set up tanks specifically for them, you know, got them to, got them to, you know, hatch and stuff just can keep the, the babies alive. Yeah. So it's almost like you've got collectoritis, you're kind of a tinker, but then at the same time, you're, you're a glutton for punishment is what it, what it boils down well, to. Well, you know what? Yes. Uh, 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 I am definitely a, a glutton for punishment. Uh, I would say I do like to figure things out. So my wife says I'm an extreme hobbyist. But once I figure something out, I just move on. So the great thing about fish, I think, is there's always another fish. So even if I were to move on, you know, I, and I and I have moved on. I I don't keep a lot of the fish that I used to. And so how did you how did you arrive at the uh, Congo spotted puffer then? Like, because I mean, this is a this is a pretty rare fish, at least up until recently. I feel. Yeah. It. Uh... It's still, people are still saying they're having a hard time, you know, finding them. And depending on what part of the country you are, you know, uh, I definitely agree with them. But other than the local fish stores that I deal with on a, you know, very regular basis, before I was dealing with them, they didn't even know what it was. None of them did. So, so they've never even had them in their store. So how did you discover them then? Uh, I didn't, uh, I was to a point where I was, I had so many tanks uh, and I'm, it's in, it's in a fifth car garage that we have. I was spending so much time in there that I wasn't seeing my kids. So I have three kids or the youngest is 13. Uh, so I decided, Hey, I'm going to buy them all 75 gallon tanks. They can pick a fish that they want. It just has to be fresh water. And so of my three kids, the oldest didn't care. So I just took that and made it a big shrimp tank. My youngest only gave me saltwater fish <laughs> and or, or fiddler crabs. And I said, no, fiddler crabs. So he kind of wandered off and just played video games. Uh, but my my uh, middle daughter, Peyton, she picked this puffer fish that I'd never heard of. Um, and then as I'm researching and going, okay, they're like, where are they? <laughs> <laughs> they're, and then, they're in a war torn then, conflict yeah. country is where they are. And then finding them and being like, what, $300? I can't do $300. That's a lot for a fish, you know? And from that, at that point, it was like, well, she was, she was very persistent on it. I said, well, okay, I'll try to find them. You know, I hit, I basically got on every store waiting list, called other stores and other states and tried to get on their list. And from there, it was just for, it took us about a year to find any of them. And she, she ended up finding a guy that was selling them on eBay. And I'm like, it's eBay. You don't buy fish on eBay. She's like, well, they're here. So she was, you know, again, very persistent in her desire for it. And you couple that with my desire to figure things out and breed them. <laughs> I, uh, I'm like, oh, fine. We'll buy four of them. <laughs> Just don't tell your mom. Oh, nice. And so where did they, I mean, can you say, like, did they come from in the States or were they shipped? Oh, uh... uh, yeah, they they were from a, a guy in Connecticut that that uh, got a hold of some of them. Interesting. Um, uh, but, yeah, they were $300 a piece plus shipping. So it, was, it wasn't a cheap investment. Uh, you know, I, I say investment. It wasn't, it, it wasn't a cheap investment. Complete risk. I'd also at this point never had a fish ordered online, so it's I've o I've only purchased fish from the store, taking them right home, you know. So it was pretty stressful just doing the whole waiting for the mail, you know, delivery to come. And it was May, and it was already like 110, so that was freaking me out too. So, but uh, got them, got them in. Uh, they were fine. They were you know about two inches. From you know total length, uh, like anybody else couldn't tell what they were. You know, I put them into to quarantine. Did the the whole aquarium co-op. You know, 
med trio on them and they seemed fine uh, for a while and then moved them into their tank I think just a couple of days after moving them into their their tank came in one morning and one of them was you know floating at the top so start panicking and like changing water and you know doing all the things you really I you know should never do <laughs> but you don't you don't learn that until you do it so um, or read about it later. <laughs> so, but luckily nothing else happened to the other ones. Uh, and, you know, at that point it was just like nerve wracking, definitely not telling my wife about this. Yeah. And, uh, now, now I guess I can't share this podcast with her. <laughs> she still doesn't know. We'll, we'll give her an edited, uh, we'll but... give her specifically an edited <laughs> version that excludes all of this. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, at that point though, I, I was really nervous about getting them, but because my daughter was so persistent about them, I had started getting prepped, you know, like, okay, we're going to need snails, you know, we're going to, you are going to need, you know, this and that. So in that year period building up to the, uh, the spotted Congos, we tried our hands with pea puffers, which are cool puffer. I love them. I say that I love them, but when you have little spotted Congo puffers of the same size and smaller and then getting bigger, they're so much cooler. <laughs> <laughs> they're, I mean, if I, everybody knows I have one, my, uh, my spotted Congo puff, puffer named Poe, and I mean, I, I adore that fish. He is so cool. They, every single one of them have their own unique personalities. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they're, you know, they're the size of a pea puffer. At a few stage or at one stage of their life, but uh, we tried our we also tried our hands at uh, the Amazon, uh, the South American puffer. Sorry, so we also tried our hands on the South American puffers. Got six of those in for a, a 240 gallon I have in my office. It's a community tank kind of a, a deal. So I'm like, hey, it's a community puffer. Uh, it was, they were great. I loved them. They were a little bit skittish for a while. Uh, and I fed them a hundred percent snail diet. I got to a point though where they were still, I mean, they were eating a lot. They were like little fat, you know, sausages just, you know, swimming around. But all, all, uh, or there's five of them that wouldn't, their, their teeth just kept getting huge. So. And I could tell they were they weren't eating as much as the other one, which would go and like chew on the rocks in the tank. So then I, you know, had to do the whole clipping of the teeth and stuff. Which I, at that point, after the first time, I went, I will never do this again. Pretty stressful, I would I, imagine, for you and the fish. Oh, it was. Oh, I can only imagine what the fish felt like. You know, based on what I felt like. Right. Right. Uh, I, I videoed it, and uh, no one ever saw it because I was swearing so much at just being nervous. I'm not a, I'm not a big swearer, so you know it's here at the office too, so it was, it was even better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, it was afterwards. It was just, you know, yeah, it was horrible. So I quickly rehomed those to a guy that I had met that keeps a lot of them. Um, and he can clip teeth like nobody's business. So, but uh, and then from there, when it got green spotted puffer as well, um, didn't like the whole brackish thing though. So that one quickly became rehomed as well. Yeah, that's an episode right there, just talking about your experiences <laughs> with brackish water. <laughs> so I mean, I I think I mastered it, uh, but I just didn't enjoy it. I didn't like the way the things looked. So I loved the puffer. He was great, uh, except he ate any other thing I put in there, so or just killed it, not ate it. So at that little, maybe a month before we found the the uh, spotted congas is when we ran into, uh, or when when we rehomed him. So it was good timing. But at that point, I was like a snail breeding professional as far as I thought. So. Uh, I was putting out more snails than I had anything to eat. So 
And it was one of the snails that I was breeding a lot of, uh, turned, it happened to be, I found out later, was on the, like, it was a invasive species. So you, you can't just like go, hey, I've got all these snails, be a normal, non-educated, you know, fish owner and just go drop them off in the canal or something, you know? Yeah, yeah, fish and wildlife. Should never, ever, after, yeah. You should ever, <laughs> never, ever, ever do. Yeah. Um, but uh, they, so you, you can't just get rid of them. You have to euthanize all of them. So that's another thing I never, ever want to do. But uh, they're, they get really, really giant. Uh, they're... What are they called? The South American apple snail. So, but they basically eat anything that's green. So if, if it's growing in the water or out of the water, they eat it. So it, uh, it's not it's not a mystery snail that you can have in a tank breeding and you know go from there. But they definitely they definitely helped uh, just because they breed really fast and they grow really fast if you're feeding them green food like duckweed and stuff. So uh, between those and then really gearing up on the mystery snails, uh, finding people that have just boatloads of the ugly mystery snails that, you know, aren't the sellable ones, they, they lay, as long as you're feeding them a lot, they just are constantly laying eggs. Uh, and then it was just figuring out a way to hatch them, but with with the the snails. So we should back up here, and you're you're really going to have a lot of editing in here, or you can just <laughs> ask me to re-say this. But no, we're gonna so, we're gonna keep it as is. Yeah, I think the snails are the are the key to why they they uh, bred for me. The, the I'm not saying that I bred eyes. them; they bred for me. Uh huh. Um, it is my opinion, uh, because I only feed them snails and I feed them a lot of snails. Like, you know, your average newbie, right? You just, Hey, look, they're hungry. They're, they look, they're on the glass. Of course they're hungry. You know, well, yeah, you can feed them too much to the point where they kind of just sink to the bottom and kind of like are almost on their side. <laughs> Not dead, but wishing they were, I think. You know, kind of like Thanksgiving. So, but yeah, they, they go, you can feed them to the point where shrimp crawl all over them and <laughs> see so that you want, you want to avoid that. But, uh, with, with the snails and, and breeding those and figuring out the best ways to hatch them, um, to get the most hatching and then, and then, uh, raise them quickly. And that secret, by the way, is green beans. So. Canned or or, uh, or raw? Uh, canned, cut, no salt added green beans. Okay. So uh, I go through about five cans a day oh, wow. currently. But I, I have a lot of them now. Sure, so. sure. Although the Fajaca puffer that's at the house eats just as many snails every day as all of my other ones combined, it seems. So, but... Uh, I'm uh, probably overfeeding him too. So then you're you're at a point where you know you you got the four um, puffers in. One of them died. You've only got three left. So it, and so then you're you're feeding them these snails. I mean, I guess what were some of the first signs of like breeding behavior or knowing that you've got well, you know male females? Yeah. So right after the the one died, and I started you know doing the water change and stuff. I, I would say. Four or five days later, I saw ick on on some of them, and that, that that was the first time I've ever experienced it. I've heard like horror stories about ick and how you're you know you're just screwed and you know you're just ick is the end. You're done, right? So luckily, I'd watched that med trio on Corey's and. and it was or on the aquarium co-op, and it was hey, you if you see it, you treat for it. Now I tried catching them, and I couldn't get them out of the tank, so to put them back into quarantine. So I just panicky. I'm like, I'm gonna just treat the whole tank. Now 75 gallon. I I I follow the directions like perfectly from the bottle. So I'm doing water changes every day, and like. 
I get I get through the course and you know vacuum and the, you know just probably traumatizing these poor things. And I I keep thinking I I keep seeing it I keep seeing it so I kept doing the water changes like I was doing like thirty percent water changes every day it was horrible in retrospect but then towards the end of this like eight days of doing this all of a sudden I see the male is like attached to the uh, female and she's like trying to knock him off I'm like what is happening. And this is during the quarantine. Pro- the uh, you're hitting them with meds. This is happening. Yeah, so I'm, I'm hitting them with uh, Icax, and it, I'm like, okay. So I'm pull out my phone. And I'm like, okay, what is you know what's happening? Uh, and you know, I haven't had them long enough to figure out. Okay, I'm gonna breed them. I didn't do as much research as I probably should have, but again, not you know, not the best thing in the world. But yeah, so I mean, I find out oh they're they're breeding they're gonna spawn I'm like this is the coolest thing uh you know changed my phone over and like started videoing i have like nine hours of video <laughs> of him just swimming around trying to get knocked off and ended up having to go to bed and so i didn't get the first spawn um just could see eggs at the bottom you know up on the glass and and just was like pumped so i took pictures and video every day and kind of like saw them, you know, do their thing. And then they started hatching, which I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. And then you eat it. You know, they just, they'll eat them. So they're, they don't eat like really small Daphnia, which small Daphnia are like bigger than the fry of, of these things. So, but they'll eat their fry. It's the weirdest thing in the world. So there's yeah. some other instinct in them that is causing there's, them to eat their, their, their young. There's, it's something for sure. Huh. Yeah. It, uh, I mean, I've, I've done a lot of testing. I've thrown, you know, again, the, the glorious, uh, peacock goby fry. Uh, I throw those suckers in there and they're either just a lot faster swimming and, and or avoid them. Uh, the baby or the, the fry, puffers didn't seem to they actually almost went to the parents I would say hmm. you know kind of their little community kind of right, like being right. adults but uh, yeah so it, uh, pretty sure I lost all of those um, not totally sure wasn't keeping great records then uh, but it sure what at that point it was just like oh, crap I felt bad I'm never going to tell anybody this happened no, and about three days later, my male was attached to the other female. And did at you? That point, did you know, you know at this point that the yeah, third one was we, a female? Like I now, I know I have two females. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so, yeah, so it, uh, which was was cool. I mean, that's the easiest way to to sex them, in my opinion. Is you know, is there a male hanging off the bottom of them? <laughs> so. But, uh, you know, at that point, it was like, all right, wait a minute. here's all, all the things that I did. I had, I set up another tank, and I'd read some articles that the pH had to be, like, super low, and I should say my pH was 7.5, I think, at the time. I had a lot of tannins and stuff in the water, though. Um, I don't know why, though. I think just because I liked the way Malaysian driftwood looked. Um, nothing was on purpose. Um, and then I, at that point, I also had a sump on the, on the tank. Uh, so they bred, <clears throat> watched all the eggs, you know, scatter everywhere. Um, uh, and a lot of them actually landed on a big coarse intake or a sponge filter that I had. I'm like, cool, because they'll be easy to watch. And then I see the other females, they're spawning. So they'll spawn multiple times before he, the male lets go or gets knocked off. I'm paying so much attention to them that I'm not noticing the other female is just slowly following them and eating all the eggs. Oh, wow. Oh, so, so they're, well, not, they're not affixing the eggs to one particular spot of the tank? They're just kind of no, they, floating around and letting them go wherever? Well, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I've since learned a lot more in that the male dictates when and where he's gonna push her, have her, you know, push out the eggs. Uh, and it's, 
it's at the top of the tank. So he'll, they'll be somewhere in the tank. He'll push her up to the top and like to the point where water is splashing out of the tank. It's crazy. Um, but it's always on or very close to like vegetation. So, uh, my current spawning tanks now just have, you know, big, uh, plants on one side. Um, and they'll swim all over the place, or sh- the female will. But when it, when she gets where he wants her to, you know, to be here, uh, you know, he does his thing. But uh, that's actually how he got his name. Our my male pufferfish's name is Chad. Chad, <laughs> interesting. Because so, he's a hanging Chad. Ah, uh-huh, there he go. All, for all the older people, that <laughs> wasn't my idea, but I thought it was funny. So but it's it is a it's a fascinating thing um the spawning part. Now getting to spawning is a whole other thing and I think it's where some people that may have or could have been breeding them already probably changed something. Um I didn't notice it at first but when I uh, like the fourth spawn I'm like okay it, it's only been 3 Three spawns now, but, you know, there's been so many days between each one. So he was, like, ten days later, and he was, you know, he connected to the first female again. So ten days after that, or eight to twelve days, I took off work. Like, I'm sick. (laughs) So he can't call me in. And I just sat, I, like, literally sat in front of the tank and just watched him. and, And the male was just, like, beating a crud out of the out of the females uh but the one that hadn't spawned particularly more than than uh, the others so i thought it was just being mean i like i wanted to like pull him out and like put him in his own little like two gallon tank just to be mean you know that that's how you that's how you felt it was just like no you know come on uh and i again this is all my own opinion and just from observations but uh I believe that's actually the courting part. Or I shouldn't say courting. I'm going to say exhausting. So uh, he, he gets the female to the point where she's just too tired to swim away, and then he can latch on to her. Uh, I have a great video. I, I don't have a video of the actual attaching part yet, but I've got the closest that I've gotten to it um, up on our our YouTube channel. But... He just chases her over, and it, it it can go for days, um, like, and just is nonstop. I mean, it's 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 rough to watch, um, but at the end of this video, you you see him like, okay, she's not moving. He's getting up there, and I mean, he gets so close to to, to biting on, and then she just kind of smacks him, just stuns him. You know, it's kind of like floating there for a second, but they do. I think a lot of people, a couple of people that I've spoken to um, just recently that have removed, you know, the male, they didn't necessarily know it was a male at the time, but the, the mean one that was picking on everybody else, you know, they took it out of their tank. Have, just having lots of hiding places and stuff at that point, I really started putting in hiding places. Uh, I didn't have it, a lot of extra tank space. Everything was full. Um, to like take out the other female or, you know, to protect her too. So just kind of overpack the tank with lots of plants, lots of, you know, coconut huts and stuff for them to hide. Um, and, and they would hide for days. I, I wouldn't see them for days during the day. They'd come, I'd started feeding them at night because they the females would only come out at night because the males seemed to not harass them as much. Um, you know, and I've since noticed that the male will only, he only will latch on and spawn the female during the day. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen at night, but I've not yet been able to, you know, say it, it does. But from my experience, he won't. So he, he kind of calms down at night. But, uh, and then so so in your experience then the one of the kind of critical things is is allowing that you know what we perceive to be as unfortunate and kind of difficult to watch but that aggressive chasing and um you know kind of wearing them down behavior is is critical to actually having the breeding to happen 
or to facilitate her breeding. Yeah, absolutely okay. is. And then and it's, so, it's not just our perception. I know the females hate it too. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I can't. I can't imagine they find it enjoyable. Um, and then, so going back to the pH, right? You were talking about uh, your pH water. You're keeping tannins. Have you found that to be a critical aspect in in either the breeding or raising? Um, I have found that. Uh, well, I, let, let's fast forward just a little bit so we can give a little bit more insight into why I'm making some of the observations that I'm making. So other than other since that first time, the since the first spawning, uh, they have unless I intercede have spawned each female every eight to ten days since then, since May of two thousand eighteen. So this is when they first spawned. And so and in between then they're able to get enough rest and hiding uh, that obviously they're not they're not exhausting themselves to the point of death. Well, they didn't. They haven't died. But yeah, I have. What I, what I started doing is when one of them. I mean, before for somebody that doesn't have a whole lot of tanks, to make sure that they weren't like killing over dying and, and dying of exhaustion and you know just being harassed all the time. Uh, between those eight to ten days, really like the right after the spawn to like five to six days, I would take the male out and put him in a just a twenty gallon long that was it's directly across from the female's tank, so he can see him, he acknowledges that they're there um he doesn't get what I call the stress pattern um i the stress pattern is when you got your fish and you took it home and you're looking at it, <laughs> that pattern. It's kind of like the, it's kind of like a, it's almost like an eight in dots, but like with like really light patches, you know, circles from on the head and, and then on the back. I know that didn't explain it very well, but I've got lots of pictures and stuff on my Instagram and, and stuff as well. And I found a YouTube video about it. Um, again, my my theories on it. I should I should clarify. But uh, so I'll, I remove him and let them rest and suck out as many eggs as I as I could or or as I, as I wanted. I should clarify that too. It definitely is easier to raise eight fry than it is to raise five hundred fry. Uh, not necessarily right at the be you know the beginning's the beginning you have to overfill with you know the foods that they can eat and and things but when they start eating daphnia and you have five hundred of these things you know and you're you know going through three pounds of daphnia a day um and if it you know these the puffers if it doesn't move they don't eat it so it's 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 horrible or, or or a good thing too, I guess. But and so then, in one in one spawning, you can potentially get up to five hundred eggs. Um, no, that's just the most I've hatched. Um, um, I've heard from a a guy in Germany, not the the big giant guys in the commercial operation, but uh, one of the one of the guys in Germany that's also breeding them. Uh, he's he's estimated upwards of two thousand eggs. Wow! So on the on the upper end. But on the lower end, he's thinking it's about a, about a thousand in a typical spawn. Wow, that is incredible. And so, and so then I guess what is your, um, so the puffers, they breed, um, they've got, they've laid eggs. So are you, I assume then you're collecting the eggs out of there? Yeah. So what, what I, up until the spawning tank that I'm kind of working out kinks on right now, but, um, I would just let them, I would remove the female, I'd put her in the, a little timeout thing, which was really just like a little floating thing that she couldn't get out of because the, the, the non-spawning female wouldn't eat all the eggs. Um, which I should note, so as soon as the male releases or gets knocked off by the female, uh, he, you know, he'll, he does like protect wherever he thinks the eggs are and gets really mean about it, which, which is, you know, the other reason I, I take him out. Because, uh, like, you get, like, ripped fins, like, bad, you know, 
horrible things where, again, where you want to put him in like a little two-gallon just to make him suffer. You don't, but you want to, you know. Um, but so I'd, I'd take the female, the non-floating female, put her in a, a little timeout floating thing in the same tank, but she can't get to the eggs. As soon as the male releases, I take the other female, put her in another little container floating in the same tank, and like triple feed her. I typically give them like 16 to 20 ounces or 20 grams of snails. That's kind of what I've gotten to, by the way, is for feeding them. I do it by do it by grams, so I don't overfeed them. So it seems to to work out, regardless of like the you know, including the shell weight. So uh, I typically feed eight grams in the morning, eight grams eight grams in the evening uh, to each fish. So um, to each female, sorry. So. But the male won't eat any of the eggs, but the spawned female will start to eat the eggs as well. So that's why I take her out until I can suck as, out as many as I want or I can find. And I just use like a little air hose with a little, you know, kind of mini water siphon, you know, and just suck out what I want. And then put those, I put those eggs, well, first, before I put them in where they're going, I'll it, lower the water real low and then use a little pipette and take out any that are white. So only only the eggs that are clear are fertilized. So the ones that are like off white or, or just white, those will fungus up like, you know, a couple hours later um, and then just wipe out all of, not all, but most of the other eggs. Um, so, and that's what I'll do is I've got this little, uh, Gallon and a half acrylic. Uh, I think it's a. I think it was a fish catcher. You know, one of those catcher fish things. Um, but it's just like a. It's like a, a one and a half gallon tall aquarium. Yeah, it's like a f- five inches by maybe six inches. You know, if it were, if it were width and width and length, and then maybe you know, ten inches tall. Uh, well, what I do is I just stick a one of those little preset heaters, you know, set to 76 degrees in there. Stick a, a, a airline hose with with a weighted uh, bubbler thing, shoot uh, air stone on it. Uh, turn it on, not to full blast. I, I put it maybe. Let's see here. First, I position that stone so it's about an inch and a half off of the the bottom of the tank, uh, and then turn it on as high until I can see the eggs. They they'll like start to lift up, and then I'll just turn it down a little bit. So I'm getting a really high flow of water on them, um, and then I follow the directions using uh, the meth- uh, methylene blue, the antifungal stuff. Um, that's what I do currently. I've, and then every, every day, I were on day two, day three, and day four, I'll do a 50% water change of that water, uh, suck out any white eggs that I see fungusing over. Um, and if it's questionable, if it's a questionable egg, I want, you know, I try to be safer than, you know, sorry. I'll chuck those eggs in just into one of my Neocaridinia uh, chair shrimp tanks. And every once in a while, all of a sudden you end up with, go, oh, I've got 15 little baby puffers in there. So, um, but, so suck out any, any fungusing eggs and, and then repeat the, uh, the methylene blue. And then, I don't know why this is, again, I've, you know, I'm still taking notes, and I'm just getting to the point where I'm experiment, experimenting a lot more with temperature on the eggs. But at 76 degrees, on the night of day five after spawning, um, I'll turn the air down considerably on the on the uh, air on the air pump, and sure enough, you'll you'll see the uh, the eggs kind of like start popping like a little popcorn. 
Oh, interesting. It, how would you stumble across this? Um, the honest answer is just sitting and staring at them every single day, repeatedly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, lots of lots of just staring um, and watching and you know trying to just document stuff um, to show my kids and stuff. And it uh, again, I I. Don't know if at 78 it would be four days, or if at 72 it would be you know 11 days. It could be you know there's a lot of a lot of things that I want other people to help me find out. So, but uh, you know at that point they'll I'll take the eggs, or I'll take any anybody that's hatched. Um, you're just using a little pipette. It's the most. I'm sure there's a better, easier way to do this. But I've not tried it yet and or thought of it. Um, just use a pipette and I, I suck out each hatched puffer one at a time. Put it in a little glass. Depending on how many I have, the glass gets bigger. And count, you know, and make notes as I go. Which is why I know how many hatch. So, uh, from there, any, any eggs that don't look like they're going to hatch that day, um, I then take out and count, count those separate from the fry, and then I have, I put them into a tank or one one of a few tanks. I try to split them up just in case something goes wrong. Um, that I've got there's a little I've got five gallons and I've got ten gallon ones uh, that are planted uh, planted tanks. They've got shrimp in them. Uh, Lots of snails, uh, and lots of food. So they're a little, I would say they're, they're like a LR Brett's kind of tank. If you, if you're familiar with kind of very natural, very, um, they're not display tanks. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're nature. Lots of little, uh, infusoria and little critters that are everywhere, you know. Um, all of which are too, big for them to eat. So there's a, a great picture that I took of a, a little baby that was just hatching, or a little fry that was just hatching, and he just happens to be surrounded by like, all right, there's a flatworm, there's a there's a detritus worm, there's, you know, a paramecium right by him, there's some snail eggs. So, you know, all of all of these things which other than the paramecium are bigger than he is, you know. Uh I mean, they are very, very small. Yeah, I'm looking um, at that picture right now on your Instagram, uh, okay. and, you, and you've called out all these things. Yeah, that's pretty neat, and the the puffer definitely is tiny. Now, the, the, I should know I didn't in this picture, but that puffer isn't fully hatched yet, so half of that weight is still the egg that is attached to it, oh, or wow. the shell of the egg. So, uh, yeah, they're they're almost impossible to see if you know if you're not like really straining your eyes to find them. And so what's so, the what's the first food then? So the, I mean it's in this tank with a bunch of food but it's obviously too large yeah. for it to eat. So then what are you what are you doing for their first food? So my first I don't know, my first maybe 5 or 6 attempts at, you know, hatching them and stuff. The real only success that I had was I I was having so very limited success on hatching them that I went, okay, you know what? They're definitely on this pattern. I can get eggs whenever I want. I'm gonna I'm gonna test some things out and see how little work I can do. So, what I my favorite test is I took I took about 30 eggs and put them uh, in about 40 tanks at the time. Um, so just different shrimp tanks, different you know I put them everywhere, even in my Daphnia culture, you know. And then I knew how many eggs I marked on each aquarium, how many eggs I put in there, what date I put them in there. And then I just, you know, I, I, on day five, on the night of day five, I started looking and I started counting. And sure enough, I started, you know, seeing little fry. And by day eight or nine, you know, all of the fry are going to definitely be hatched by then or not hatch. Um, so I knew how many I had in each tank. And then I just... That really heavily fed the shrimp and, and the snail populations got like insane. Um, 
didn't do very many water changes. Basically, I was trying to get stuff small enough for them to eat to grow in the tank, but not kill anything too. So, um, and sure enough, every every single tank that I put them in, uh, sumps, you know, everything except the Daphnia culture. Um, most, if not all, in each tank hatched just on their own. Um, cause I also put them in there on, you know, day zero or day one, I guess. Um, so they didn't get eaten by the snails or the shrimp or, you know, anything like that. Um, at, from that point on, I would say if I, I probably had, I don't know, there were a few hundred fry at that point. Within, uh, ten days, there was a quarter of the number though. There just wasn't, wasn't enough food to, the tanks, you know, tanks were too big. Something was happening. I couldn't tell you exactly what. Um, and at that point I started researching, okay, what in the heck can I feed them that's small enough that I can like figure out a culture? Uh, and then I came across an article on laboratory, laboratory zebrafish. And it was a study on feeding them like Flake foods versus feeding them paramecium. And it's been a long time since I've been in high school, so I did not know what that was at first. So, but I read that and it was basically their growth rate was like triple that of, don't quote me on this, on this, but it was much greater than, than feeding them anything else. And they lived longer when you started them with this. You know, these are the zebra fish for laboratory research. So I looked up how to how to make uh, or grow paramecium, which turned into infusoria. Is the only thing I could find, like you know, and that's to take tank water and boiled vegetables and leaves and stuff. I don't know if you've ever made infusoria. Cultures. No, no, I haven't. It's a. Uh, I recommend anybody watch a you know the bazillions of videos that are on YouTube that tell you how easy it is. Some of them will will make mention to the smell. Uh, but basically what you're making is a big vat of bacteria water, you know? It smells like death. <laughs> Put it that way. So, you know, here I'm an overdo-it-er, so I, I've, and, and every single video says you have to do it in a jar, you know? So, I, I go and I buy like 200 mason jars, and I just got shelves of, of infusoria cultures going. <laughs> you know, kind of staggered so that, you know, they don't work because I'm just scared to death that they're not going to, you know, I'm not going to have enough food to feed them. Um, and I will say my fish room, you, at one point, I think when I had everything going, you could smell the smell outside, not luckily, not inside the house, but outside the house and in the fish room, it, it, it knocked you over when you first opened that door. So definitely had to figure out something else. Um, found some really old blog posts about boiling wheat, like wheat grains, or I can't remember what they call them, like kernels or uh, some weird name, but it's raw wheat seed. Um, and you, you boil those, they last a lot longer and they don't smell as bad. Uh, I don't buy the not smelling as bad. It smells pretty bad still. <laughs> um, but I've I've also found that so if, if you're trying to paramecium is like this magic I have discovered it's like this magic food now for these babies. Um, and how long are they on paramecium for? Um, as a as a whole as a as a hatching, uh, about thirty days is when the last one would stop would would be big enough to start eating uh, uh, just hatched baby brine shrimp. But uh, so that's the problem is they all, they all grow at different rates. So, and doing, doing water changes seems to speed it up, but not a whole ton. Um, I've tested out different, you know, not water changing at all um, to, you know, once a week to every day to, you know, and I've not seen a difference in growth pattern, but again, not scientific at all, just my experiments. Sure, sure. Because um, I am lazy. I don't want to have to do a lot of work. And and it, the first, they can be exhausting. So uh, 
it's not just feeding them, you know, once a day and making sure they eat it. I've, I've found that, you know, you'll have, you know, let's say 200 fry in this five gallon tank and, you know, you're feeding them five times a day this, you know, this paramecium. So you, you can't just be dumping the water in there. So you got to filter, you got to filter the crud out of them, which is more videos that are coming soon and or I can talk to people one on one about. But so you want to be just adding the paramecium and nothing else, you know, no bacteria or nastiness. But I found that if I even missed one, one of those five feedings a day, so if I got stuck at, you know, in a meeting at work and I just, I don't live too far. I live about eight minutes from my, from my work. But I'd, I'd come home and one of the tanks that I had, let's say two, you know, if I had two tanks with 200 in each, you know, one of them would have half of that. I mean, they just are gone. Wow. Starved to death quickly. It, it seems. I mean, there could be lots of other factors going into it, but I, I have seen repeatedly that if a, if a meal is skipped, of the, in the paramecium stage, um, they just you just lose a lot of them quickly. Wow. That is a, that is so, a very high maintenance. It's very high maintenance. Um, my my thirteen year old son though has some inventions he's working on to try to help us out with the the mid afternoon is the, always the hardest one. That's the one that seems to get skipped the most. You know, between me being able to go home for lunch. And them getting home from school. <laughs> so. Well, I like that the thirteen-year-old though he's come he's come back around from just wanting to play video games to now he's back. Uh, he, he's working on some inventions for the fish room. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, that. That didn't happen until I let him sell the the little puffer that I gave him. So, and then he he kind I think he just kind of saw money, but. <laughs> I'm like, you know, that's funny. No, but no, he's 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 pretty invested now. He's like, when somebody comes over and looks and goes, hey, you know, they want to buy like eight or nine or ten of them. He's like, I don't trust these people with our fish. Oh wow, nice. <laughs> Which that's a whole other story to get to. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. You know, talking to more on more breeding. The the paramecium part is the is the hardest. Uh, I definitely have found keeping them in those planted little tanks with lots of shrimp and lots of snails and lots of stuff. So basically overfeeding the tank um, so that you get the little things growing. You, my mortality rate goes down considerably than if I have them in just a, a bare bottom tank. Do, you know, doing the same feeding schedule, same water change schedule, everything. Having them, having them, uh, place to hide, having, you know, all of that. They, I didn't know it right at first because they kind of go through these little stages, like where when they first hatch for that first week, they're all like up on, if they almost like know that you're coming to feed them and they all hit the front of the glass. But from week two to like, oh, I shouldn't say week two, I should say like day eight to today 50. They like hide from you at all costs, like, and they just need a little teeny tiny leaf to hide behind, you know. And as as you move your head, they move their body, so you you can't really count them. Yep, but at about fifty to fifty five days old, they start hitting that front glass again, saying "feed us, feed us." So you know when you have fifty fifty little puffers or you know two hundred puffers doing that, it's well, you know how it is with yeah. your one, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's it's, pretty cool it's the same feeling. It's, yeah. it's just like, yeah, I'm gonna feed you, and and they and they will eat a lot. Um, they love the Daphne and stuff. Yeah, so I guess let's do let's do a high level flyover then. So we've covered uh, paramecium pretty well. You said that after 30 days they're doing baby brine shrimp. So how? So just high level walk us through. How long are they just on baby the brine? Order? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's the order of it? Um, so yeah, the first, I'd say day one through fifth. Day one through fifteen, they're all on paramecium. Uh, starting about day fifteen, you'll get some that can start eating smaller, smaller things, um, baby brine shrimp sized, and you and you'll see it just because you, we have, again I've allowed it to grow in the tank, 
so I can see them, you know, eat something that's not a paramecium. Um, at that point, I'll start, you know, the uh, the next day I'll start uh, doing the baby brine shrimp. So, which would be around day 16. Uh, by day 30, they'll all be able. They're all of them are eating baby brine shrimp. So, um, and you don't have to feed the paramecium anymore. So, depending on what I've got going on, I'll actually let my my paramecium culture. What I'll do is I'll just add a big cup of tank water from another tank. You know, all it takes is one one scoop of water, and within a week you'll have a you know a little um, a copepod culture, you know, going on. So, because they're eating all the paramecium. So, or you can throw Daphne in now, and they'll they'll take out the paramecium a lot faster than the the copepods. Oh, okay, so then you're you're feeding you're feeding food. Then feeds other food that you then feed. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Nice. Well, yeah. Of all of the tanks that I have, the majority of them are for food of food. You know, to you know, then feed to my fish. Right. Right. So, yeah. Uh, the only level I don't do anymore is is grow my own algae. But um, so, but back to the days. So day thirty to anywhere from day forty five to. Um, Day 45 is the soonest that you'll see some start to be, or one of them start to eat something like, like a baby Daphne size. Um, but until, I'd say, so 30, uh, about 45 to 75 days, all of them will be able to eat, um, and or take down a, an adult Daphne. So at that, that, at the early stage of that, I most often will just keep feeding the baby brine shrimp because it's easier. Um, I don't like it because you do have to do more water changes because you, you have to definitely overfeed the tank. They're not going to just swim around looking for food everywhere. They kind of have their little areas or they gather up in groups. So to make sure they all are eating, you've got to like really overfeed it. So then you got to do a lot of water changes when you're doing the, the baby brine shrimp. Um, but at about well, my current batch, uh, they're 54 days old, um, and they started, they're the soonest that I've, I've had every, every puffer in there I've actually seen eat, you know, a, a Daphne of some size. So, whether it's small or, or big, which is great, cause then you can stop the baby brine shrimp and then just almost have like a mini Daphne culture going in your tank. Um, you have to add Daphne every single day, though, because you're not feeding the Daphne enough to really survive and, you know, multiply, because that will end up killing everything else in your tank. Um, but so at, at that point, you've, you've just got lots of Daphne. Um, depending on the size of the puffers, uh, I'll, I'll sort by size, and I've just got little sifters that sort them. Uh, the cool thing is Daphne are super, I didn't realize this at first, but as far as like their physical bodies, they're super strong. Like you can, you can like high pressure hose them into a screen, you know, a sorting screen stack and they're, you know, pretty good to go still when you put them back in, you know, if you want to rinse them off and put them in a tank, most of them don't get bubbles under their, whatever it is and float to the top and die. Them. Yeah, in uh, in Rosario, yeah, going. in uh, Rosario Lacourt's book, he talks numerous times about like high pressure water hose screening Daphnia, <laughs> and like I thought, <laughs> I thought it was really funny that he infina- emphasized like the high pressure water aspect of it. But to hear yeah. you come along and also say, yeah, man, you can really <laughs> hose those suckers down. You know, I I don't know this book. I want to know more about it. But uh, yeah, I know I discovered it because I needed little teeny ones at one point. And they were all like staying in like the top part. They were like getting stuck on the between the screen and the large Daphnia. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I was just like, "No, I got to try something." So yeah, like full full blast the water from uh, the faucet, which is all another thing, you know. It's tap water. Uh, I just full blast that thing, and sure enough, like, hey, I worked. Nice. I'm like, okay, but they're all gonna probably be dead. Yeah. You know, Put them in their tanks, and no, they were they were all perfect. Nice. So then, what what comes uh, after uh, what comes after Daphnia? 
So af- Daphne is a long time. So um, let's just say I'm going to say the average of all of the of the fry being able to eat Daphne is about 65 days. They're they're going to eat Daphne uh, up. Well, I don't have any that aren't eating Daphne, even my adults. So forever. <laughs> oh, interesting. But as far as the growing stage of, def, of, of feeding them, uh, they'll start picking off like little teeny tiny like hatched snails, like just you know like those newly hatched ones, um, between the seventy-five and a hundred-day mark. Um, they they ignore the the uh, snails for a long time. It, it surprised me, but then at uh, Definitely that hundred uh, hundred day mark, uh, they'll start eating like small snails. Um, they have a hard time with ones that don't have a point to them when they're well, actually all the time. But uh, they'll they don't really eat all of the snail when they're before like one hundred and thirty days. I've noticed so they'll leave a lot left over, so it kind of rots. So you got to vacuum it up. They, they're not crunching the shell. They're just trying to, like, pull it out, kind of like a pea buffer, you know, with a bigger snail. Uh, and for, uh, but about 100 and my, my range here, Nog and all these don't necessarily match, but they're, the range is, say, 130 to 175 days, uh, they'll start crunching on little snails. Um, and doing a much better job of pulling out the whole snail um, on bigger snails. So, I mean, you're, you, so you're looking at like a minimum four month commitment of really hands on before, you know, kind of an established ecosystem tank really helps you to go more cruise control on these things. Um, yes. Now, I, one thing that I, one, when I got was getting to the point where I thought I was going to be like rehoming some of these and I was getting worried because I'm like, I'm not going to have enough snails to feed all these people or all, all these guys. Uh, so I, I, I think it was about, I had one big group of, of, of puffers that were at the time, I think they were like 110 days old. Uh, I'm like, I'm going to try mini bloodworms. I'm not a fan of bloodworms because to me they're kind of like junk food, you know, but I don't know why I think that. I read it somewhere and then I just, you know, believed it. I, but I try these mini bloodworms. I put them in there and some of them are like, the bigger ones are like just munching them up. They're getting super fat stomachs. Uh, I'm like, cool. And then I see one like freaking out. Like, it's going all crazy weird. And then it stops, I'm looking at it, and it's got, it's choking on a blood, on a mini bloodworm. So these aren't big bloodworms, they're like teeny. And it, I'm like, oh crap, I watch it for like five minutes, and I'm like, I gotta do something. So I like, put gloves on, I, at that point I was like, not move, it's not like swim, actively swimming away. So I just kinda like cup it in my hand, pick out some tweezers, and I just, I have to pull out this blood worm from its mouth. Um, and then sure enough, it went over and tried to eat another one and I had to do it again. <laughs> oh, no. So, no more mini blood <laughs> worms is the, is the gist. But, yeah, so it, I found that they, I don't sell them now until they won't, until I verified, like, that actual buffer does not choke on blood worms. Ah, okay. Um, because I, not everybody's crazy like me and, you know, has 600 gallons worth of Daphnia tanks and stuff, you know, going on. So if they're going to do what most people do and probably just, you know, throw bloodworms at them. Mm-hmm. And so, so, so on average then, I mean, so this is really touch and go for each puffer or uh, could you it, give like another... It, it is. I, I've since, I've since started every... Every so, I don't know, every 30 days maybe or so, I'll try to resort um, and move them all around based on size. It's just once you move, once you combine, one, you know, one group of juveniles from one spawn to another, and then it's like, okay, now I've got to tell these people, okay, this is either from, it's either from this one or this one. You know, but most of the time they're within like two spawns of each other, three spawns. Um, the growth rate seems pretty 
study. Um, the females are, in my opinion, twice as big as the males at certain stages. So I, I think I've proven it, like to myself. I've separated an entire um, spawn by what I believe is a male and what I believe is a female, which I haven't sold any of them. Uh, now, the only thing I have to do to prove it out is, you know, breed them now. <laughs> right, <All of> them. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm definitely not going to prove, prove it out, but you can definitely tell once, in my opinion, I think you've got about a 60% chance of being able to tell when they're 50 days old. If you're, as long as they're eating well. So, but, um, but yeah, so once they're anywhere from 20, 20 to, or 120 to 140 days, depending on the size of the puffer, um, is when they won't choke on the mini bloodworms anymore. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, uh, puffer by puffer, uh, observation. So, and it's, you know, I've never let one die before. Um, in fact, I've only, when, when they're really small and they all change it different, but they have like a camouflage pattern to them, not the spots. Um, and they start getting the spots around 45 to 75 days, depending on the fish. Uh, but not figured that part out yet, but, um, but once they get those, once they get those spots, they, their spots don't change, which is really cool. So if you ever get a little teeny tiny one or a whole bunch of them, and if you've got six or seven puffers in your tank that all look identical, you can, if you, if you take really good pictures of each one before you put them in, um, yeah, you, know, you can identify them, like kind of like zebra stripes and stuff. Yeah, you know, yeah, they're yeah. It's like so their own little fingerprints. Definitely that one. Yeah, very cool. So, Preston, obviously, man, I mean, you know, thank you so much for walking me through this. You know, at least from the uh, the breeding experience, you know, watching the male female observations, um, you know, just really diving in super deep into the the feeding schedule and just how labor intensive it is. But I mean, clearly, you're getting a lot of joy and enjoyment out of this. So, how else can people get a hold of you? I know you've got a YouTube channel. I want you to go ahead and and share that and any other social media where people can follow you and reach out and just you know help grow the body of knowledge that is is the uh, breeding show anti puffers which is what i want to do so if we could get you breeding you know some of these suckers then you could tell me all the good ways that i should be doing things instead <laughs> so that's, yeah. that's you know I, i'm definitely encouraging that um i would say i've given away probably 3 to 350 uh puffers to people that I've met, spoken with, they definitely have a passion for these guys and want to try to breed them. So I gave them what I believe to be trios um, on top of what they're what they're doing. Um, with the only the only rule is you've got to share with me everything you learn and everything you find that works, and most definitely everything you find that doesn't work. Um, and so we've got a, a plan right now to start take, you know, compiling all of that information and putting it onto a free website, which would be the whole scientific name, you know, spelled out that you're on Shout and Denny. Did I say that right? I, we're going to roll with it. <laughs> I don't know. But just in case, I also have SpottedCongoPuffer.com. It has a backup. Which we'll forward to it. Exactly. Yeah, nice. So, uh, just that we're, we'll publish everything that we, you know, I, I think they're, they're a mini Mabu puffer. Now, they're all the same personality, just not as big as, of a food bill. And if you had one, one or three of them or more, um, but all that same personality as you know. Uh, so th we'll have a, a public free website there with that information, hopefully sometime within the uh, you know, next six months. Uh, and then I'm on Instagram at, at Preston John. Uh, that's where I share stuff more often. Everybody's uh, welcome to, to send me private messages. I have constant, uh, I've, I've gotten eight uh, in, or direct message you know, things sent just during this call you know, from oh, wow. Instagram. Uh, and then, 
the uh, YouTube, which doesn't get updated as much just because of time. It's really hard doing YouTube stuff, you know. Um, but that's uh, the channel name is Paid in Full Aquatics. And it's a lot easier to find by going to Instagram and clicking on the link there. Right. And I'll make sure <laughs> I've got channel. Yeah, and I'll make sure I've got links to all that in the show notes. So Preston, I mean you you know, I love that you are such a, a wealth of knowledge that you're willing to take time and really talk about your experiences and your journey with this fish. And then on top of that, like you just you just want to share, right? Like not even just the knowledge, but you're actually like sharing these you know, pretty high retail price fish with people that have a genuine, honest interest in them as well. And I'm sure that you've probably kind of developed your own internal checks to make sure it's not somebody that just wants to resell them. Like you've probably gotten pretty good at feeling people out. Um, but I think that's amazing about you, man. I think that's so awesome. And I'm so glad that you came on and, you know, just to share your story. And I hope people really appreciate and just hear that, you know, the passion that you have for these fish and, you know, how you want to continue to share knowledge about them. So, you know, thank you very much for coming on, man. I really appreciate it. Hey, you are very welcome, and when you're ready, I've already selected out a few a few different options for you to add to your uh, to your collection. Oh man, dude, that is that is too awesome. I don't. That's uh, yeah. Between the podcast and what's going on in the fish room, and you talking about all these different things I need to breed or to grow, um, I think that's definitely a challenge I want to take on eventually. So I'll have to. Uh, yeah, that's you're making that too tempting, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't. For you, you don't have to. Uh, you're you're spreading the good word here, so. Uh, if you just want to have some, I, you're, you are always more than welcome to them. Oh, man, that's awesome. Well, I definitely know for sure if, if there's an invitation there. If I'm ever in the Phoenix area, which I was going there for work, I'll have to hit you up and maybe we'll meet up, get some lunch, and uh, get a chance to, to come into your fish room and check out this amazing setup you have. I would, I would enjoy that. Well, Preston, thank you very much again, man. I really thank appreciate you, it. Thank you, Randy. Thank you again for listening to the Aquarius Podcast. As always, get involved in your local fish club help grow this wonderful hobby, and have fun with other fish nerds.